God is so good. Let me ask you a question. What did you come here for today? That's good. I ain't come to be seen. I ain't come to be heard. I've come to be seen and heard by one person, God. The music's important. The word is important. Please accept both as from God. Amen. We're living in some dangerous times and uh, some of the stuff I've been reading lately and some of the stuff Jeff's been sending to me. We live in some very dangerous times. If we're going to be ready while coming our way, it starts right here. You can't wait until Tuesday when you're under persecution. What was it they said Sunday? Oh, that's right. I weren't there. Well, what was that sermon about last week? I don't know. I got up walked out in the middle of that. Oh, what's that praise and worship song? Well, I don't know. I went in the bathroom, went outside, and called somebody and come back in. You know, honestly, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a pastor, I'm trying to be a shepherd. And it's important that you understand. This is the most important two hours of your week. It's more important than getting up in the morning and going and reporting to work. Because right here, right now, you're getting stuff that's going to help you through the week. More than anything else. Oh, it's nice to get training at work. I love getting training at work. Most of the time I was the one, seemed like I was the one going out and they were training me and I trained others. That's fine. I didn't mind. I didn't mind training people as long as I had some training beforehand so I could pass it on. But you know what? This training right here, training at work is training for working. <coughs> training today is training for reigning. R-E-I-G-N-I-N-G. -E -I -I Amen? Now, the most important thing, I remember on several occasions they told us to get stuff out of our house because the hurricane was coming or tornadoes. And you know what I always went back in the house and got before I left? Always. I said, you know, uh, uh, now my wife was trying to be, she was trying to see me how I did that. So one day she said, if you're on a deserted island and you can have one item with you, what would it be? And I said, my Bible, of course. I said, all right, Miss Holy, what would you want if you were on a deserted island and only going to have one thing? She said, a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I said, touche. Amen. Okay, I want a boat with a Bible in it. How about that? So remember, this is so important. Not here to try to make you feel better. I'm here to try to lift you up. It's my, my duty as your pastor is to get you to where you need to be. And I don't want to stand before the Lord. And the more I study, the more I see, the more the, 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 the more fear I have of God that I do my job correctly. And so, so again, it's so important. This is, again, the most important two hours of your week. Please take it. Take notes. Do whatever. If you don't have to see, see I, I, I take this all the time. When, when somebody's preaching, you see me taking notes. You know why I take notes? Because honestly, this is a psychological fact. People remember about 50% of what they hear at the moment. And then it drops down another 50% within the next few hours. So now you're only retaining 25% of what you heard. So I go to church all the time. You're only retaining about 25%. Of course, the Holy Spirit will give it back to you when you need it. And I like that too. But let's, let's do all we can to be attentive. To worship and be attentive to the word of God because this, God sent his word and he healed them. God sent his word and he guided them. God sent his word and that brings me comfort. But things were going crazy with Bethany. The only thing I could think of of Bethany, everything was going crazy. Every time I thought we were getting somewhere, the docs come in and say, well, we thought we were getting somewhere and here's this and here's this. I'd always go back to the word. Always. Because no matter how shaky that life was, this is never shaky. Amen? And, and so, uh, y'all, it's really important that we get into the service. You ain't got to sit who can shout the loudest. You ain't got to sit who can dance the most. Just get into it, however you want to. It doesn't matter. Some people like to shout. Some people like just to sit there quietly. Some have a little tear out the side. You know, this even gets me more now that, that I'm doing B5 because B5 in the last few weeks... 
I've had these guys coming to me and they're crying and I go in, I go in, I'm with them in an open setting, but then I go in and counsel them one on one. And uh, Friday I was calling right there to counsel with this guy. He's been there for four weeks now and he's working on his doctor's degree. He's a bad dude. Okay? But he got he got in trouble with some drugs, but he, he he's gonna be alright. Uh, and he even told me, he said, you know, let drugs take me down. But Friday, we got there, and, and when I walked in the door, I shut the door, and I sat down and said, now, what is it I need to talk to you about? What do you need to talk to me about? Go, man, what's going on? And immediately, immediately, he burst into tears. And he said, in this last four weeks, I've seen more of God than I have my whole life. He's 30 some, 35, 36. He said, I've seen more of God in his last four weeks than I've seen my entire lifetime. He said, my master's degree, part of my master's degree is world religion. He said, I've seen more of God in the last four weeks. And he says, when I get out, can I still come to you? I said, yes, you can. He said, you've shown me what a true relationship with God is and what it can do. And he just wouldn't stop crying. I just let him cry. And then I said, well, by the way, do you know anything about Turabian? <laughs> papers. He said, well, I'm good at trading. I said, I got a 25-page paper. You want to grade it? I said, <laughs> and he said, well, give it here. Give it. I said, no, I can't do that. I just play it. I can't, I can't give you my papers. You can't do that. It's, it's illegal for me to give you stuff to work for me. I said, but I just thought I'd throw it in and get you smiling. He said, he said I'm just, I know I'm crying, but I'm smiling because he said, thank you for showing me God. And I thought about that. Here's a guy He's been to church all his life, 35 years old, got a degree, master's degree in world religion. And it took him getting locked up to see God. My question is, do we see God? Do we see it as hunger? Do I come to church hungry? No, do I come to church hungry? When I get up in the morning, do I, do I crave God's presence? When I'm in trouble, not just when I'm in trouble, anytime, do I crave his presence? Do I crave him? And I told him, and the guys just kept coming to me and going, man, this is so, so I'm going today at 3 o'clock to minister to three guys that have already been released. And they said, preacher, can you please, I got that one of them was a Muslim. He called me Friday and said, man, man, can I please get in with y'all two guys? I said, Yes, you can. And so at 3 o'clock, I'm going to a halfway house in Greenville, and I'm still ministering to three of these guys that's already out. So they don't have to get it, but they crave it, and they want it. So my question is, do we crave it, and we want it? Because if we crave it and want it, it's here. It's here. It's here. Now, Let's get our Bible. And please take this as I'm not scolding anybody. It's not scold. It's just uh, daddy taking care of kids. You know, mama's cooking supper. My daddy used to tell me, I go to eat supper, and daddy said, eat it. I said, daddy, I don't like it. He said, I don't care. Eat it. I said, daddy, can we do something? He said, your mama ain't a short order to cook. I said, but I'd rather have it. He said, I don't care what you'd rather have. This is what you need right now. And then mama said, okay, I'll give you two choices. I said, that sounds good. She said, yeah, take it or leave it. <laughs> And I developed a love for collards and pigtails because of that. And I love black eyed peas because of that. Because initially I hated those things. But I love them dearly now because I developed it as my mama made sure that I got fed. And I promise you when you come in here on Sunday morning, between here and here, you're being fed. There's no doubt. Open up. Take it. Between B5 and just between the study, as I'm, the study that I'm doing right now, I just walk in fear. God, am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Am I trained the way I'm supposed to be trained? Am I giving the word in the way it's supposed to be? And next week, get ready. Next week, we're going to be talking about being crucified. Be here, please. It's not a sad thing. It's not a bad thing. I wrote a paper last night. Six pages on being crucified. And God spoke to me and said, now I want you to take that same paper, make a sermon out of it, and preach it next week. I said, okay, Lord. So, y'all ready?
Y'all say, y'all say, hallelujah, something. Hallelujah. There you go. Hallelujah, something. Do you know if we were in Iran or Iraq right now, they could come in here right now, and not only would they pull us out, but they'd put us on that world, those roads, and they'd put crosses on the road, and they would hang us on crosses on that road to let people know, do not go into church, do not worship Christianity. <clears throat> now, today, on crosses, just to give people a warning, leave Christianity alone. And we got it so everywhere, oh, everywhere. Ready? Let's get into some good stuff here. Leaving church one Sunday, I ask you why'd you come to church? Leaving church one Sunday, a woman said to her husband, do you think that Flanagan girl is dying her hair? I didn't even see her, replied the husband. And that skirt Mrs. Jones was wearing, continued the wife, do you think, you think, uh, do you, tell me what you think, was that appropriate attire for mother of four? He said, I'm afraid I didn't notice that either, said the husband. Huh, scuffed the wife, a lot of good it does bring you to church. That's good. Y'all say that's good. Get your Bible out. Numbers, chapter 13. This is the last one. We're going to talk about being crucified next week. I want you here. Please be here. Can't make you. I just tell you, please, because the food is on the table. We have homecoming every week in here if we'll take it. Amen? Get your Bible out. Numbers 13. Stand for the reading of the word. Here, partake of it. <clears throat> Let's just go to verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We come into the land whither thou sendest us, and surely it flow of milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people that be strong, people, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are wild and very great, and moreover that we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the north, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess him, for we are well able to overcome him. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Amy, which come with the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Again, I have to keep going back to it. We were in... Our own sight as grasshoppers. And again, we were in their sight to this. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to be in your house, God, because all over the world is <clears throat> it's, it's getting rough, and it's getting rough here. And believe it or not, we believe it, Lord, but believe it or not, it's getting ready to happen in this place. In this, this United States, worse than it is now. And Father, I ask you right now, Lord, to minister to us and through us, Father, and help us, Lord, to understand and be ready for what's coming and to know that you're in total, absolute control. We do not turn to the left. We do not turn to the right. We don't look behind us. We're looking straight ahead, and we're believing, God, that something special is happening this day in our very eyes. I ask you right now, Lord, to help us feast at your table today. Put it in us, digest it, and know that you've got something special for us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Look at somebody and say, if you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. Tell them three times. <laughs> you be seated. Again, I'm just going to go through a few of them, just a couple of slides, just trying to get us back for those that have not been here so you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Of course, uh, how many of you ever feel like you've been in a tug of war? I'm not talking about with your wife, with your husband. You've been in a tug of war with the world. You've been in a tug of war with Satan. You've been fighting. You see, like every time you turn around, you're just fighting. 
You know, we, we, when we go in in the morning to B5, uh, there's a, a, a board up and it's got everybody's name on it. And they put me on it too. And it says, how long have you been sober? Some guys have been sober 20 days. Some guys have been sober 200 days. Mine says 40 years. <laughs> it does. 40 years. Then they ask, how do you feel spiritually? 1 to 10. And they go, most times they'll say 9 or 10. This is how you feel uh, physically. And they'll say 9 or 10. And how you feel emotionally. And then uh, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10. Then it says, do you have anything that you want to talk about? And can you describe how you're feeling today? And then, what are you thankful for? And it's amazing to watch these guys. And there's a new guy, you know, one of the new guys come in, and he said one. How do you feel physically? Zero. How do you feel emotionally? Zero. Describe how you're feeling. And I can't repeat it. I sit down beside him, and I have my, uh, I keep giving them all away, I can't keep, I just keep giving them away, and I, I have one, either way I win, because the court's not going good for him, and so I, I took, he had Bethany, Team Bethany, and God's got this, I said, get that to me, and I gave him one that says, God's got this, and either way I win, and I handed it to him, of course, now I got 15 guys, so they want one too, but at least this guy got one, and, and I, I just think about what I'm seeing in that little bitty area is happening in this great big area too. We just don't want to show it. The guys there, they, they're free to talk about it. But we're not free to talk about it because everybody thinks we got it together. Everybody thinks we're on top of the world, we got it all together. And so we struggle. These guys there, they'll tell you, and believe me, some of those guys have not been to Sunday school in quite some time. Some of them can quote the Bible and cuss at the same time. So good. And they'll let you know what they think. But we hold it in. We suppress it. We don't tell anybody. We just hurt and hurt by ourselves. Struggle. Well, guess what? God's calling us to move beyond our feelings. Move beyond our limitations. Get ready for battle. And the way you get ready for battle is, number one is, there's going to be a first battle. It's to battle your own personal battle. And know this, when you choose to walk by faith, we're met with resistance. You're going to meet resistance. Always. 100% of the time, you will meet resistance. But that resistance is what is we call struggle. But if we don't have that resistance, our faith is is empty. Our faith is hindered. We don't want to experience this struggle, but you know what? You cannot walk by faith without it. Now, again, I'm just going to quickly go over the things we've gone over the last four weeks, and then we're going to hit the new stuff, okay? No, that look, look, a lack of struggle produces spiritual weakness, loss of spiritual edge, thanklessness. It makes us spiritually lazy. God has become a cosmic sugar daddy. I just tell my father what I want. He does it. He goes and, he goes and gets me what I want. That's not how it works. He's the commander in chief, and we're part of his army. And we're to go out and get it done for his kingdom. So over the last few weeks, we've been talking about this. I'm going to go through it real fast. God left the giants in the promised land. He said, I give you the land full of milk and honey, but you have to possess it. So, so he, he gives us the giants in the land because first they needed to learn how to fight because giants distinguish the difference between professors and possessors. A lot of people talk a good fight, but they, they don't, they're, they're not there when it comes time to fight. Number three, giants expose the grasshoppers in the crowd. When giants show up, grasshoppers speak up. When you, you get to know yourself in the struggle and you get to know your God and realize many times he is your only help. Last week, we talked about this. Remember, look, sometimes, sometimes maybe you're searching amongst the branches for what's only found in the roots. So here we go. You get stronger. You put down roots. You dig into word and you dig into prayer. Jeremiah 17, 7, 8 says, Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord and 
whose hope is the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and she and shall not be careful in the year of drought, but shall cease from yielding fruit. Or fruit, not fruit. Fruit. Mm -hmm. Praise God. These glasses, I put them, these are brand new pair of glasses. And these are whole set of eyes. We're trying to get adjusted. Okay. Seven. Struggle produces thankfulness. And number eight. It makes you become aware of the excesses and the unnecessary things in your life. Here we go. That's all the stuff from my past. Number nine. I'm going to do ten, I think. So let's, let's, here we go. Number nine. New stuff. Commitment. Listen carefully. It's not what it takes for me to start that shows my commitment. People start all the time. <clears throat> I remember going to the Pitt Detention Center and a guy that went to high school the same time I did, his team played our team in basketball. <clears throat> my age. I walked in, I saw him, I talked to him. And he said, dude, this is my last time here. He says, it's my first time and my last time. <clears throat> I said, cool. God can help me. He says, God's going to help me. I came back and the next month he was gone. <clears throat> came back the next month he was there again. He said, I know I told you it's my last time, but I promise you, this time is my last time. This went on. He was there. Seven times. Each time he told me, I promise you, this is my last time. Well, <clears throat> I quit going to general population. Now I go over to f -blocks. I was over at f -block one day, and that's where the federal guys are. <coughs> I go over f -block, and I look up on the balcony, and I said, that guy looks familiar. Who is that guy? And I walked up to him, and he said, hey, dude, you played the basketball lately? And I realized the guy that was never coming back. But now he's in federal. He's not in now. Wow. See, it's easy to start. Every time he got out, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back. It's not what it takes for me to start that tests my commitment. It's what it takes for me to quit. That tests my commitment. What does it take for me just to give up? <coughs> what does it take for me just to say I'm through with it? I don't have anything else to do with it. I've had enough of it. The struggle's been too hard. I can't take it anymore. I'm not going to struggle anymore. I'm through with it. If you want to test somebody's commitment, remember, it's not what it takes for them to start. It's what it takes for them to quit. That tests your commitment. So number nine, struggles Test your level of commitment. The only way to truly gauge your level of commitment, the only way to even see your commitment is through struggle. I was talking to those guys Friday, and one guy said, we always ask the very first question, how are you doing spiritually? And he said, he said, he said, preacher, can you tell me something? I said, what, I said, what does that mean? I said, what do you mean, what does that mean? He says, what does that mean? How am I doing with God today? He says, it means that we're living right, <coughs> doing everything right, crossing our T's and dotting our I's and no. That word, how's it going with God today, is talking about your connection. How's your connection today? Is your connection strong or is your connection weak? Is your connection good or is your connection bad? And I said, now I'm going to tell you something right now. I said, one thing you're going to have to do to test this is you're going to have to get brutally honest with yourself. Today, if you want to test your level of commitment, you have to get truly, <clears throat> brutally honest with yourself. Not by your feelings. Ask God. God, talk to me, reveal to me, show me. If I don't like it, tough. Show me, God, so we can fix it. So, the guy told me, he said, I like what you said, the connection. I said, that's right. 
And I looked at him and told him, I said, I said, I tell you what, I've been with you now for several weeks. I can tell you one thing. He said, well, I said, I said, if I was in the foxhole, you'd be one of the guys I want helping me in the foxhole with me. He said, really? I'm here in B5. I said, you may be in B5. I said, but I can see God in you. God's radiating. And I know that you would stand strong and you wouldn't run. You got that commitment. So watch. Joshua 24. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you're going to serve, whether the gods which your father served, they were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Ammonites, Ammonite, Amorites, in whose land you dwell now. But as for me and my house, I'm committed to God. Take the word serve. And as you break apart the word serve, inside is commitment. Struggle is not there to tear you down. Struggle is there to build you up. But it's also there to prove something to you because God knows if you're going to make it or not. You know what? It's amazing. Judas was in the crowd. Judas, God already knew that Judas was going to betray his son, but he still, Judas had a good heart in the very beginning, and Judas was one of the disciples, and Judas had the power that other guys had, and was casting out demons and doing the stuff the other guys were doing. Even up to the last, Judas could have changed his life. I know there's some Calvinistic thoughts that he was born to do this. Well, there's all kinds of, you can do all kinds of studies, and that's fine, but I really believe that any one of them could have betrayed Jesus. Matter of fact, they all did because they ran. Just Judas was the one that led the, the military out there to them because Judas was thinking that if he goes ahead and leads the military out there to him, then Jesus is going to raise up his earthly kingdom. He weren't trying to destroy him. He was trying to push him forward, and when he tried to push him forward, he wound up saying he was destroyed, so he couldn't stand it. He went out and hung himself. He couldn't take the pressure. Of what he had done. So, so, so here we go. Say serve. Serve. Do this. Serve. Now open it up. And say commitments inside. Serve. Commitment. When those two get lined up, guess what? There's nothing we cannot do together. Absolutely nothing. So, Struggle qualifies you, or struggle tests your level of commitment. It's going to get better, I promise. Just when the caterpillar thought the world was over, it became a butterfly. You've heard about metamorphosis, and what goes on with the butterfly. When the butterfly goes into the cocoon, it is a caterpillar, a big old fat, juicy caterpillar. It is eating, 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 eating. It is so plump and ready. It goes and starts spinning its cocoon. When it spins its cocoon, it's in darkness. While it's in this darkness, all of a sudden, the body begins to transform. That cradle big juicy butterfly becomes like jelly. And so, in that jelly, God is working. And so, in the darkness, God takes, changes the form, the absolute form in the darkness of that butterfly. Nobody's ever asked a caterpillar what it thinks. And we're interviewing a man on the street caterpillar. What's the thing about getting in that cocoon? We don't know. But I can tell you this, if it was me, I'd be upset because all of a sudden I'm in darkness and all the things that I thought were my strengths are gone. All the things I thought I could rely on are gone. Everything's turned to jelly. So as the caterpillar turns to jelly, God's working to work in the dark. And in that dark place, he's lost everything. He cannot move. He's stuck. He's held captive to the cocoon. And so there he is in the dark. Everything he trusts in is gone. And he's having to wait as God is working that work. So you all in here right now, you don't even realize it. You're in your cocoon stage right now. It's dark. Everything that you trust in, everything you were preparing for is turned to jelly. And watch, jelly, 
You're thinking, God, I, I got nothing I can even stand on now. It's in the dark. I don't even know what you're doing. I can't see what you're doing in my life. I said, everything's twisted upside down. Everything's going crazy. Well, then the day comes when it comes out of that cocoon. And that beautiful butterfly. And even to get out. I've told about it before, so I'm not going to get into it hard. But even has to struggle to get out of the cocoon. That's because his wings do not have the fluid in them. He has to push against the cocoon. As he pushes against the cocoon, he strengthens his wings and fluid runs into his wings out of his body. So now he's ready to go. Just when the caterpillar thought the world was over, it became a butterfly. Number 10, struggle qualifies you for rest. Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I will make you lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. That word yoke is literally between two ox. That yoke goes on their neck so they can pull together. They're in transit. And he says, you take my yoke and you get beside me, and we're going to work in the field. When he says, I give you rest, does not mean that he's going to stop you from laboring. That word rest is an agricultural term, which means to rotate crops. So literally what he's saying is, I know you're tough. The crops have drained your soil. Your nutrients that you need are gone. And so you need something, you need something fresh in your life. So God's going to rotate your crops, change your struggles around a little bit, because you are physically and emotionally exhausted. Labor physically, heavy laden, emotionally, you're just exhausted. Anybody here ever been like that? <laughs> Amen. Hebrews 4 and 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into rest. That rest, lest any man fall short after the same example of unbelief. The children of Israel, they could have gone, so about the children of Israel, they could have gone over into the promised land. 11 days. 11 day journey out of Egypt to the promised land when they listened to the naysayers and they listened to the wrong people and when they listened to the wrong people saying the giants were there, we can't do it, we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, then God took care of them. For 40 years they wandered in the wilderness and for 40 years all those people 20 above, 20 and above died. Can you imagine how many funerals there was a day? They're marching around, doing a funeral, march around, do a funeral, march around, do a funeral, march around, do a funeral for 40 years before they got over and could have been in the promised land. But again, the promised land, they were still fighting, but God was there, so that was their place of rest. So, I told you, yeah, I'm not going to take long. You're getting, some, you're getting some more answers today, I hope. The stronger the faith, the harder the test, the greater the rewards. Stronger the faith, the harder the test, the greater the rewards. Number 11, struggle qualifies you for the reward. 1 Samuel 17, 25 says, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that's come up? Surely to the fight Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and give him his daughter, and make his father's house free. Israel. I want you to think about something. Now David didn't do it for this. David did it for the cause. My God is being destroyed here. His reputation, everything's on the line. But since there's going to be reward, I'll have some of that too. He said that man who killed him, the king will enrich him with great riches. Think about it spiritually. When we begin to operate in the struggles, and we begin to, to get in there. Have you ever been in a struggle and somebody say, how in the world did you go through that? And you go, I don't know. Or you'll say, it's got to be God because I can't do it on my own. He will, make, he will give them great riches. Fountains of grace open up. Number two, I'll give him, I, I will give him his daughter. In other words, now, that's just to share that you're, you're in the body of Christ and that you're moving forward because you're having that struggle take you out 
and cause you just to lay, lay, by, the, lay by the wayside. And number three, this house will be free. In other words, that was talking about taxes. You will go beyond what that struggle is that is taxing you, and you'll find the freedom. So, so, struggle qualifies you for reward. And then finally, once you watch this now, this is careful, once you watch this, pay close attention. discussions at Lee University. I've got guys that are working on their doctor's degree to be psychologists. I've got guys in there that are working on a ministerial degree. They're going to be pastors. And then I'm working with counselors and working with therapists. And so we interact all the time. Every day we're interacting. Last week it was talking about and to give us problems every week. And we have to solve the problem by helping the people. Some weeks we get three problems. Some weeks we just get one. But they give us these problems. And we're supposed to try to figure out how to biblically and psychologically together. That's what a pastoral counselor does. He takes psychology and blends it with, or the Bible and blends psychology in with it. And so you've got both. And we have to figure out the problems. Well, one of the problems was there's this family, young family, that they're having problems with raising their kids. And the Husband's not helping, and the wife's about to lose it. And they have they can't get their kids under control. And so the pastor opens up a young couples class for young married couples and says, Now they go in this young couples class, and you were the one that was asked to lead the group. And said, You go in there, and right to start with, she unloads. I mean, right out unloads. What you going to do? And so, of course, I said, you know, I said, I, uh, of course, the first thing you know, I'd settle her down. Let her say what she wants to say. Let her be brutally honest. But you don't have to be brutal to be brutally honest. And then I uh, gave a chance all the talk and then bring in some of the peers to go back and forth. So I was trying to do the things, plus to use all the books that we've been reading that week. And then I wrote in, I said, this happens in B5 all the time. I've got heroin addicts. Some of these guys have never been to church. Some of these guys, I don't think, has ever been around other people. Because of their mouth and because of the way they act. I said, so I'm sitting here with all these guys and I'm having to keep them from consuming one another as we talk about God helping us to get over our addictions. And so, so I put that in there, and, and uh, of course, one of the guys is getting ready to be a doctor. He, he sat back and said, yeah, and he, he threw out all these, he threw like 25 book references to me, and it looked like I had to get a dictionary to read all the stuff he was saying. Good Lord, have mercy. Then this young guy <laughs> says, well, I've been in Bible college. I'm starting my second year of Bible college. He said, I'm, I'm still 19, 20 years old. And he said, the only thing I can think about in any kind of counseling like as a teenager, and he said, he said, and I read what you said about this, and he said, wow, I'm glad it's you and not me. And I thought about it. Why am I not scared? Even startled to go amongst those guys. Some of those guys are in there, believe it or not. Some of those guys are still in there for some heavy duty crimes more than drugs. And they're going to prison. This is their way to get some help before they go to prison. And so, why am I not scared? This guy said, I couldn't do it. And here's what it was. The struggle. The struggle. What has made you what you are today is the struggle. What you had to fight for, what you had to fight against, 
and what you had to overcome. That's what has made you. And I guarantee you, you don't even see it. I've been around some of y'all guys for 10 years, 16 years. I've seen some of y'all guys, and y'all don't even see necessarily how much you've grown. But I look at you, and I see giants. I see powerful armor because I've been with you through the struggles, and I've seen what it's done. And you think it's hurt you, and it hasn't hurt you. It's actually enabled you and it made you stronger than you've ever been. And the things that you used to would go, you go boo and you'd run from now. No, nope. don't bother me because it's a struggle. If God had just beat you, keen you all the way through, and God had been a, a spiritual slot machine and a spiritual uh, candy machine, you couldn't handle anything. But because of the struggle, what you had to fight for, what you had to fight against, what you had to overcome, that's what makes you. And God allows that in your life because he wants to make something special out of you. We're not just, we're not just the infantry. You know, we aren't here. We're the special forces. You know, got that, the, 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 the uh, uh, Delta Force. Got that hit, the, the hit terrorist a couple weeks ago. The Delta Force come in and got them. And I said, God, let our church be a Delta Force. Let our church be the Navy SEALs. Let our church be the Rangers. Let our church hit the beach not be afraid. And again, here we are talking about struggle. Struggle is what makes you. So watch this now. Get ready to close. Jeff, you can start coming up here, buddy, if you want to. Get ready. Psalm 35. It says, weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping literally in psychological terms means intense psychological pain. Pain that is literally at times unbearable. It's emotional, physical spiritual, mental pain that sometimes you will feel that you will fall and be crushed under the load. It says weeping may endure for a night. That word endure means just keep on on and on and on. For a night. That's not midnight at night and it's over at six in the morning. It means you may be hurting emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally for a dark season. Because that word night literally means dark season. I was sitting here this morning, we were practicing, and somebody somewhere, I don't know who did it. And maybe it weren't as loud as then was close to me. But y'all remember Bethany would sit back there and she'd always have a whistle like me. She'd say, whistle, daddy, whistle. Here's what she would do. Woohoo! And then be funny about it. Here's what she'd do. Woohoo! All the time. Woohoo! And she got really excited. You could hear that woohoo! And this morning we were playing. And it probably wouldn't slap everybody as it was to me just because it just hit me. Because when DC started practice, the first few bars that he hit on one of the songs brought me right back to that pew right there. But Bethany's urn was right there. And my heart dropped. But then I get up and start playing and somebody can hear I said, I bet you in heaven, that's all you hear all over the place. Woohoo! 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 I had no idea that last year her life was going to be so dark and be such a struggle. And it was emotional, physical, mental, spiritual pain like I have never had in my entire life. And I hold 
hold on to this verse because I knew the pain was there and I knew night was not a 24 hour period. I knew it was a dark season in my life, in Bethany's life, in our whole family's life. Somebody else not long ago lost a daughter. And I just all I could say was, I don't know your pain. I can't even imagine it. Because your relationship, your daughter is different than my relationship with my daughter. But one thing I can tell you is I remember the struggle. And I know it doesn't last forever. Struggle is an instrument of transition. If you're taking notes, now is the perfect time. Struggle doesn't last forever. It's an instrument of transition. When the disciples were on the boat, Jesus sent them on the boat in the middle, middle of the lake. A bad storm comes. It's taking them down. It seemed like they, was, they were lost. They were going out of here. And Jesus comes walking on the water. And of course they wind up on the other side. Peter gets out of the boat. Walks to them, all that. The point I make is that storm Bible said they struggled all night, struggled, struggled all night trying to keep the boat afloat. But that storm and that struggle was actually a means of transition. It was an instrument God used to move them from here where they had the fishes and the loaves to here where the man was in the tombs. And to get them ready for where we got the fishes and the loaves to live here fighting devils, they needed that storm to get them ready. So the storm got them ready, but also it didn't last forever, and it moved them in a position where they could be used by God. Jonah's fish, he caught it in the belly of hell, 
there was a means or an instrument transition. Struggle. It means that you're on your way somewhere. The devil wouldn't fight you if you were going nowhere. He's had a while this seems to be happening right now. You ever thought maybe he's trying to keep you from getting where you're supposed to be? He's trying to keep you from getting on your feet and moving forward. That lasts forever. It's this one transitional. And it means that you're on your way somewhere. It prepares you for your future. Struggle does. If I hadn't been through all this struggle all these years, I'd be scared to death in B5. I wouldn't go to B5. Have nothing to do with it. Also a council on Thursday nights. They go in there and do counseling. And I got put in a room with a guy accused of murder. He said he's in here, he's in here for murder. He's already served six years, going on the seventh year. Here, hadn't even gone to prison yet. He's in the detention center. I said, can you take the chains off of him? And they closed the door for just me and him talking. When I said that years ago, I said, leave the chains on him. Hook him up to the wall. Because I don't want to be in here with a man accused of murder. Again, struggle. Struggle. Struggle has made you who you are.
slide. It's not going to last forever. It's an instrument of transition. It means you're on your way somewhere. It's preparing you for your future. And because it's here now, it means God's fixing to do something different in your life. He's getting ready to do something for you that you couldn't do on your own without that struggle. I look out and I see a bunch of cocoons getting ready to open. And butterflies getting ready to fly out. I want us to pray this together. Y'all ready? Father, thank you that this struggle is not happening to me, but happening for me. I thank you, Lord, that it doesn't last forever. I thank you, Lord, that it's an instrument of transition. I thank you, God, that it means I'm on my way somewhere. I thank you, God, that you're preparing me for my future. And I thank you, God, because this struggle lets me know the butterfly's coming. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now, the altars are open. The altars are open. Hold on, I need to stop one more time. Do I go to the altar again? While everybody's here, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's the biggest struggle you'll ever really have to face. Is that a struggle? The flesh is trying to keep you from it. Satan is trying to keep you from it. The world is trying to keep you from it. That struggle, right now, that part of the struggle can end today. If you're here, nobody looking around, every eye closed, every head bowed. I'm not going to make an example of you. I'm not going to embarrass you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, can you slip up that hand and say, I want to know him before I leave. I don't, but I want to know him before I leave. Maybe you're here today, bless them. Maybe you're here today and you have known him. But the struggle, the struggle, you let it get between you and God. You said you see it as an instrument of transition. You saw it as a blockade. And you left him alone. You pushed him aside. You ignored his call to move forward. And right now, you're in a spiritual deficit. You're not sure where you stand with God anymore because the deficit is so big. With all the heads bowed, nobody looking around. Could you just slip up that hand and say, that's me. I got a deficit going on. I got to see it fixed. Okay, church, we're all going to do this together. Ready? I want everybody to repeat after me. This is so awesome. Remember, this is the most important two hours of the week. And for some of you, it's the most important two hours of your life right now. Ready? Repeat after me. Father, I need you now more than ever before. Forgive me for pushing you to the side, for ignoring your call to come to you. Forgive me for confusing the struggle and thinking that you did not like me. Right now, Lord, forgive me. Accept me as I am. Take me. I'm yours. I need you to be a strong Savior in my life. You said, if I would confess in my mouth and believe in my heart, you died and rose again, that I could be saved, that I could be reaffirmed. I believe that right now. I'm confessing my mouth. I believe in my heart. I thank you, God, for renewal this day. Give Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, the altars are open. Anybody needs to pray? Anybody needs anything? A prayer or needs God to do something for you? Now's the time. The altars, the altars are open.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Something special is happening right now. Something special is happening. You can feel it. You can sense it. Something special.